Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, and welcome to another Barometer webcast. Today is December 2nd, and we're on our way into the month of December, which is often a very uh, interesting time of year for trading. Hopefully, it will be beneficial to all of our positions. Joining me today is David Burroughs, Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer Capital. And we also will have James Callahan, one of our equity analysts on uh, the webcast today. So please, if you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate to send me a chat or send me an email. Uh, phastings at barometercapital.ca is my email. And we look forward to addressing those questions at the tail end of the call. And with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pam, how are you? We're great, thank you. How are you guys? Well, I'm thinking it's probably nicer where you are than where we are. It's sunny, but it's really cold. Yes, I heard there was a lot of snow uh, <laughs> earlier this week. So hopefully yeah, everyone's right. staying safe and staying cozy at home. Well, okay, here we go. Um, uh, December, and it's been an eventful year. Uh, there's been uh, lots going on, lots to think about, lots to worry about. Uh, but given, given all of the things that we've been through over the course of this year, uh, I think we're in a pretty good spot. Um, uh, today, I'm gonna try and touch on uh, some of the changes that have been taking place over the last few weeks. Uh, some people are on this call weekly. We've, had, we've got a lot of people who are on weekly, a lot of people who join from time to time. So we'll try to make it relevant for everybody. Um, but uh, certainly I hope everybody is, is staying safe uh, and, uh, and, and uh, we're all gonna get through this, this COVID situation together. So uh, just to start from the very base level, you know, we started a, st a structural bull market in stocks in 2013 when we took out the highs from 2000. Uh, it has a tendency that, that structural bear markets go on 13, 15, 16 years, which it did in the 1960s and 70s into 1981 before the market kicked off. And by the time the rally kicked off, people had come to the view that stocks would never rally again. Uh, and it's certainly how people felt after the depression in the Second World War when stocks kicked off their rally in 1951. And then for many years, investors went kicking and screaming uh, believing they, they would be back into a more difficult environment because that's what they had lived in for, for a long time. So bull markets certainly have their share of pullbacks uh, and they certainly have their things to worry about, but it's more like three steps forward, one step back. So um, if, we, if we take a look at the world as it, as it is today, um, we know that while the S&P broke out in 2013, the NASDAQ, finally broke out of the bear market it was in, in 2016, only four years ago. Uh, and we know we've been trending ever since. And um, we know that when we came into fall, uh, you know, we look at big cycles, then we look at the shorter term cycles. The big cycle we think and have talked about for years is bullish. Uh, but in the shorter term, we do get uh, corrections and pullbacks. And as we came into fall, late September, October, many of our indicators were negative, showing that breadth underneath the surface of the market or the percentage of stocks that were behaving constructively had been weakening. And, you know, probably for good reasons. People worried about a second wave of, of COVID. People were quite concerned about the election and what might happen through and after the election. Um, people were concerned about whether or not there would be additional stimulus. Um, lots of things to be concerned about. Uh, and we talked about the fact that leading into the leading into the election, we probably were at a point of maximum uncertainty and that likely over the next number of weeks, some of those uncertainties would start to resolve themselves. One of the things that was very encouraging to us is we had seen the beginning of a deterioration in bond prices, government bond prices, which means on the other side that interest rates are going higher. So these were this was the, the peak in the bond market. Uh, in, in uh, February of this year. That was the lowest interest rates. And then we sort of consolidated through the spring and summer. And then uh, early in the fall, yields started going higher. Now you would expect if you're headed into a big problem, yields would be going lower, right? Now, in, now interest rates, long-term interest rates, like 10-year bonds and 20-year bonds, they are driven by two things. One, 
is the future expectations for growth. If growth is going to be higher, then they expect that maybe rates will be higher. Or on the other hand, if you were really concerned about credit risk or not getting paid back, but we know that there have been no signs in the bond market of increased prices for credit default swaps, which is what happens when people get concerned with credit. So we've talked for quite a long time about uh, the fact that we may be headed into a reflationary cycle. We've been in a disinflationary cycle since 1981. Rates have been falling in fits and starts since then. And anything that did well in falling interest rates has been a beneficiary of that. And those are the things that are very broadly held. So what's happening is that the bond market, I believe, has gone through a topping process. And if you go back to just 2018, while bond prices were moving higher and the flows into bonds were tremendous, given people's concerns about what were going on in the world, we've seen that pressure coming off and recently really seen the bonds break down in price. So that means while people may be guaranteed of getting their, well, when they were buying them, 50 or 60 basis points of yield, half of 1% for the next 10 years, that means the capital value is falling. And, and that may put a damper on people wanting to pile more money into a 10 year bond if they thought they might lose some capital. And that often has happened when money comes out of bonds, it often starts finding its way into more risk accepting assets. Uh, and that's when we start to think about reflation. If you take a really long view of rates, just like stocks, they have long cycles. So we know that rates last bottomed in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and then rates rose from then until 1981 when they went through a peak. We've made a case for some period of time that we were going through a bottoming process and it takes time for that to take place. Perhaps it might have happened sooner if we hadn't have gone into COVID and all the concerns around that. But it's really important to understand this stuff because if you take a very long view of say stocks returns versus bonds returns, over a long period of time, stocks gave about a, about a two to one return versus the bond market. And that makes sense, they are growth assets. But there have been a couple of outlier periods from the early 1900s through the late 1940s or late early 1980s through recent times where because of sharply falling rates here and here, stocks and bonds gave the same return because not only did you get the coupon on your bonds, but you got a capital appreciation in the price of your bonds. So it, you can imagine that after many, many years of stocks and bonds giving a similar return, people would be incented to put money in the bond market for perceived less risk. What's important is when rates started to rise in the early 1950s, stocks started to really outperform because they're a reflationary asset. In fact, from 1945 to 1981, stocks went up 10% a year, bonds went up 2% a year about inflation. And so we've been watching for a resolution here because that would be a really good sign for stocks around the world and other reflationary assets. So when rates bottomed in the, in the early 1950s, for the next 15 years, stocks gave a 15% return, which is a great return. That's a secular bull market. Bonds gave 1.6, inflation was 1.6, 0% rate of return. So over time, people decide they better throw in the towel and move to the winning camp. And that's what drives a long-term bull market. So the reason I bring this up is because as we believe we've been going through this bottoming process in yields over the last few months, 10 year bond yields have started to rise in a fairly steady uptrend. And despite the fact that you would think that people would be concerned about an economic slowdown in the second wave, it's actually not having that impact on the bond market. People are looking through the second wave. Maybe it's because they believe that there's a, uh, uh, there are vaccines on the way, or maybe it's that they believe that all of the stimulus and monetary and fiscal stimulus been pushed into the system will stimulate the economy. But the upshot is that reflationary assets have started to outperform. So starting with the NASDAQ, NASDAQ 100 relative to bonds after a long period 
of, of parity, stocks in the NASDAQ have started to outperform bonds, much like stocks did in the early 1950s. When we looked at the early 1950s, 60s, and 70s, what worked? Dividend growth stocks. Because as rates went higher, you wanted a higher rate of income. And what have we just seen? We've just seen dividend growth index in the US. This is an ETF that buys companies with a history of raising their dividend has just broken out to a new high. While the high dividend in index, things that act like bonds, utilities and staples and REITs are still 17% below the highs of February. So rising dividends outperforming high dividends. That's a reflationary asset. Recently, if you take all the stocks in the US, after two years of going nowhere, the all stock index equally weighted just blasted off. That's the average stock really starting to outperform. Now, other signs of people being willing to take risk. We watch the US dollar closely versus the basket of world currencies. And why do we do that? Well, when people are really concerned about risk, they want to buy US dollars. They may want to hold US T bills. They may want to buy US treasury bonds, which are seen as a safe haven. When people perceive that risk may be falling, they're willing to take those dollars and buy assets that maybe have a little more risk or a little more economic sensitivity. And a lot of those are not in the US. So when you see the US dollar fall, it tends to be that people are becoming more risk accepting. So after falling through the summer and consolidating through the fall when people were concerned about risk, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen quite a significant breakdown in the US dollar. So to put the longer term view together, if you go back to 2011, US dollar has been a steady uptrend, but we've just broken that. So that means that investors are becoming more risk accepting and they tend to buy assets that do better in a reflationary environment. So international stocks, Taiwan's market, we talk about the S&P breaking out in 2013 after a long period of no progress. Well, the Taiwanese market was one of the first major global markets to break out to a new all time high and it went back going back to 1999. So that's the beginning of a new bull market, not the end. We look at the Japanese stock market. It's been going sideways since 1991. Just blasted off and made a new all time high. I would argue kicking off a new structural bull market for stocks in Japan. We've seen a, a breakout in Chinese stocks going back to 2015. All of these things are risk assets, things that people buy if they think the world is getting better. Other things that they might want to buy. Well, this is the, the, the index of metals and mining stocks in the US. From October to present, they've absolutely blasted off. And if you put it in a longer term context, these are would fall in with the commodities group. Commodities have been in a bear market since 2007. We are just now starting to reverse that. And commodities move in long cycles, like stocks do and like interest rates do. So very important to see international stocks, emerging market stocks, those are reflationary assets. Mining companies, basic materials, chemical companies, companies that do better in a stronger global economy. It's fair to say that while we've seen lots of stimulus in the US, we've seen it around the world. And we've certainly seen it in Canada. So what other signs are there, the things that are happening that are good? Well, we've seen the most significant weekly equity flows in the US in several years. This is in the last couple of weeks. Flows into global equities are the highest they've been going back to 2008 and before. And on the other side, we've seen the most significant flows out of bonds going back over many years. But these aren't binary events. They may be watershed events, but they're not binary events. When they start, they tend to go on for a long time. So we want to own the things that people want to buy. We've talked about being in equities. We were most focused in the US and over the last few weeks, we've been talking about broadening that view out 
to a bigger part of the world. And we've been focused in sectors in the market that have performed well in a difficult environment like those not big secular growth stocks. But over the last few weeks, we've seen improvement in several other sectors that are more economically sensitive. So when we look at our gauges today, the percent of stocks in uptrends in Canada, in the US and globally is expanding. More and more stocks are participating. That's healthy. We're not overbought where 80 or 90% of stocks are participating. We're just slightly through 50%. Now, the higher this percentage goes, the easier it becomes to make money. If more and more stocks are participating in a rally, it's easier to be in the ones that are working. Our short-term indicators, percent of stocks above the 50-day moving average are all improving. Percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum is rising. Percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows expanding. And percent of stocks trading above their 150-day and 200-day moving averages, which are measures of long-term trend, all positive. So look, there is information that finds its way into the market every day. The market sorts it, orders it, and people make decisions based on it. What I can say is this would say that investors are more comfortable owning risk assets. Now we don't like to see everybody get overly confident. That can always lead to short-term pullbacks. But recently, in the month of November, we had the market up sharply. It was one of the strongest market, market months in history. And we take all of those strong market months going back to 1950, and then look at what happened going forward. In the following month on average, markets were up 60% of the time. But over two months, three months, six months, and 12 months, up between 90 and 100% of the time, going back to 1950. So these are really positive developments. Other things that we find positive. Volatility spikes when people get concerned about risk. When volatility falls, it's positive. We are still a fair bit above the levels we were at through 2016, 17, and 18. And markets perform best when volatility is below 20. We're sitting right on 20 right now. That's a positive. So if we take the S&P, we saw the lows in March to, I think, a lot of people's surprise, including me. Markets marched their way higher with really no major corrections. We corrected through September and October. We talked about wondering which way the market would break and ultimately those clues that we've just been talking about pointed to higher prices. We broke out to the upside, we consolidated, and today we close at a new all-time high. Well, that's the S&P 500. The Russell 2000, which is the average stock in the US, has actually been much better over the last couple of months than the S&P, which is important because the Russell 2000 hasn't outperformed the narrow stock market, the biggest stocks in many, many years. And when that starts, again, you're investing in Main Street USA. So the NASDAQ, which has led, corrected through September, October, like lots of stocks did. But as things started to go, higher beta companies were the best performing. Those are the ones that are most economically sensitive. Mid micro cap stocks, small cap stocks, Japan, mid cap stocks, financials, emerging markets, industrials, China, materials, Europe, energy, these have been the best performing assets. So we talked about in the fall that leadership was broadening. That's a healthy thing. And technology underperformed. However, when we have higher yields and copper is going up relative to gold, and when regional banks are doing better than real estate investment trusts, those are all measures of risk acceptance. They've all been improving. So after the election, we had a real pullback in some of the biggest tech stocks after leading all year long. And our view was that would be something that would be short lived. It's not like money was going to leave one place in the market and go to another. If we're in a real bull market, all of these groups can rally. And that's what we've seen. The NASDAQ consolidated for a period of two weeks following the election. And now it's rejoined the rally. Today, we again, we close at a new high. Amazon, Apple, Netflix, NVIDIA, 
all of these companies regaining their footing and starting to work their way higher. So the question is, what is driving some of this? We hear about all of the stimulus that's been pushed into the market. Well, just let's talk about how significant it is. Right or wrong, this is the way that central banks are dealing with the economic weakness. Now, if you're concerned about debt in the economy, and there's lots of debt in all of the major economies, there's a few things you could do. You could say, we're gonna let the market do what it does, and if you've got too much debt, too bad, we'll watch you default. And that's what they did in the early 1930s. That did not work. It caused a depression. The value of collateral went away. You could choose to, uh, to go on an austerity program and cut spending. Really politically unfavorable, highly unlikely. Or you can inflate the value of assets by pushing a lot of monetary stimulus into the system. And clearly that's what the world central banks are doing. 21% of all US dollars have been pushed into, uh, into the market this year. So of all of the money creation over time, 21% of all US dollars were printed in 2020. Now, some people get worried about that, but here's the reality. If you look at excess liquidity measured over time in blue versus the price earnings multiple investors were prepared to pay, there's a high correlation between the two. This is the excess liquidity that's been pushed in the market. So you can choose to say, wow, that's crazy. Uh, that's really wrong. Or you can say liquidity drives asset prices. We have to be invested for the environment that we're in. So we have to expect that valuations are likely to continue to improve. And it's not just in the US and it's not all behind us. You know, the central banks have said, we will continue to keep rates lower for years. That's short-term interest rates. And we will continue to keep monetary stimulus in the system. And we will encourage our governments to use fiscal stimulus. Well, nobody, no one's getting more stimulus than Canada. We just announced more significant stimulus. So by the spring of this year, when we are getting through the population with vaccines, we will have had the greatest and most concerted efforts of stimulus in history. And that will all be working its way into the world systems. This is why asset prices are going higher. So we're in a bull market. And I don't know how long it will go on for, but if the strongest asset breaks out first, and that was the US market, and then one by one, other assets fall in line, like say the NASDAQ and the different global markets, and now some commodity markets, I think we're in the very early stages when in industrials and financials uh, and materials lead the market, it tends to be early in a financial cycle. So around the world, we're seeing expanding breadth in our models. From a leadership perspective, it's not that one group is giving up the ghost as another is picking up the baton. We're seeing strength really everywhere. So let's talk a little bit about that. This is the semiconductor index in the US. It's the most basic building block of the global economy. Companies that make equipment and chips are making new absolute and relative highs. This has led all year long since the lows in March. It's been a very steady move higher. Uh, so technology as a group, and this is the XLK index, which is the largest technology companies, just reaccelerating back towards highs. So technology includes things like cloud-based computing. It includes artificial intelligence. It includes uh, cyber, um, uh, cybersecurity, these themes continue to work. Uh, other themes that have been working through the course of the year, consumer discretionary made new relative and absolute highs recently, uh, especially if you look at it equally weighted, meaning not just dominated by Amazon, very, very strong. And healthcare has been strong. But over the last few weeks, we've seen improvement in groups that were lagging. So we've seen significant improvement in things like regional banks, or the large US banks, or the, um, 
materials group. Uh, I talked a little bit about the miners, but if you took materials as a whole, which includes chemicals and timber and so on, accelerating over the last few weeks. Um, and we talked about global markets. So we're seeing strength in a lot of places. And so when we look at our holdings, um, and uh, you know, they have, to they have to reflect that. So if we look at what we've been doing in our portfolios, technology has been a major theme for us all year long. After they corrected, we re-increased our weight recently. So this is month to month, the changes in weightings. So technology is up. Industrials, we've been building our weight steadily, second largest group. Financials, third largest group. Materials, fourth largest group. Consumer discretionary has been reduced. And when we go through the things that act like bonds, utilities, uh, consumer staples, communication services, and real estate, they are the smallest positions. So the portfolios don't look much like the market at all. Uh, we are quite concentrated and focused in groups that we think are relatively early cycle. And this can go on for some time. Now I spent a lot of time talking about macro and the big themes that we're focused on. Uh, in some of our strategies, we're actually short the bond market. Uh, we are uh, short things that act like bonds. And we could talk about those big themes. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to bring uh, James Callahan on. Uh, and James is one of our really bright young uh, uh, portfolio analysts. Um, and, and have him talk about a few of the companies uh, that we have a couple in technology, a couple in the financials, and why in particular we've rifle shot uh, at these companies in particular. So James, uh, are you there? I am, so th thanks a lot, Dave. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go through some positions that we really like currently uh, that have worked quite well over the last few months. Um, so the first name's gonna be in the semiconductor space. Uh, it's Power Integrations Inc. So the ticker is P-O-W-I, or uh, I'm, I'm gonna call it POWI. Uh, they're a $4 billion market cap uh, semi equipment company that designs integrated circuits for AC to DC power conversion. The company has been around for, for a while. Uh, it's generally been a pretty cyclical business. So they normally grow revenue anywhere from flat to mid teens. Uh, there's three segments. So the consumer segment is selling power converters into large appliances. Industrial segment is converters for large battery uh, and high powered applications. So for example, power to electric trains. Uh, and then the segment that we think is most interesting, which is selling key components for power adapters uh, for smartphones and tablets. Basically, they sell the guts of phone chargers. Uh, that's about 45% of revenue and grows 30% year over year. Um, so within this segment, Poway specializes in circuits for higher wattage power adapters. So as the smartphone industry moves towards higher watt charging, Poway gets a significant lift to the average selling price of circuits being sold to power adapter manufacturers and any power adapter above 30 watts, they really have to use Poway technology because no other manufacturer can make circuits that transmit power as efficiently uh, in such a small form factor. So growth for that charger business is inflecting right now. Uh, if I had to point to a single catalyst, I would say it's Apple's decision to decouple the charger from the iPhone with iPhone 12. Uh, but OEM chargers increasing in wattage is a trend we've seen in Android phones over the last few years. So if you look at Samsung between the Galaxy S8, which came out roughly five years ago, uh, to the Galaxy S20, which is this year, the Galaxy S8 shipped with a five watt charger and the Galaxy S20 ships with a 25 watt charger and Samsung even sells a 45 watt charger separately. So it's just as big a deal for the Chinese manufactured phones. The Huawei flagship phone right now uh, ships with a 23 watt charger, but they'll sell you a 40 watt charger for it as well. So we're seeing these charger wattages creep steadily higher and the wattages that phones can accept have moved higher too. So iPhone 8 to 11 Pro can accept 30 watts. Uh, and iPhone 12 can accept up to 60 watts. So this is great for Poway. They've largely exited the sub 10 watt charger market because it's been a commoditized market for years now. Apple needs to include the charger in the box so the charger costs as little as possible. Uh, and it's low tech, it, it's this. So this is the five watt Apple charger. I'm sure everybody has a million of these. I think this one is from the early 2010s. Um, and you, they've been around forever. So as we get into the higher wattages, complexity gets introduced because you need to fit into a realistic form factor for smartphone use. Um, and the legacy tech when you move past 30 watts just blows up in size. So you need heat sinks, more components. Uh, for example, a competing 65 watt adapter to Poway's adapter is about three times the size. 
Um, past 30 watts, Poway is able to get to a small form factor because they're using gallium nitride transistors instead of silicon. So they get more efficient, cooler power supplies, um, and nobody else has been able to figure gallium nitride out. So competitors have spent years trying, but they just can't get it. Um, Jane, so now Jane, Jim, just to, just to jump in for a second, one of the things that we've noticed over the last uh, few weeks is we've gone from a market that was frustrating for stock pickers because so much of the market return was being dominated by the biggest six companies in the world. And over the last few weeks, it's turned into perhaps the greatest stock pickers market because so many smaller and mid-sized companies that have really not been focused on by investors uh, really have come into focus. Um, are, are, isn't it interesting to, to, to see some of the companies that are coming up from under their radar screen? And we have so many small ones, we can't probably touch, touch on them all. But it's, it's so different than the world we've been in where the ETFs have simply driven all the returns. What, what else have you got in the, in the technology space you want to talk about? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really exciting to, to be a stock picker right now. There's some interesting stories like, uh, like a company called Unity. So very interesting company. They're also in the tech space. Um, they're one that we've owned since the, uh, shortly after the IPO in September. So they're a platform for creation and monetization of video games. Um, so most, actually just over 50% of all video games that were developed in 2019 were built on Unity's platform. Uh, the platform is used by some of the biggest game developers in the world uh, and some of the smallest, uh, newest game developers. Uh, there are three segments really to the business. The first is called Create, which is about a third of revenue. This is the tool used to build video games from the ground up. So it's subscription-based software service, uh, which is obviously a great business model. We've talked about it before. Um, it's, it's tiered based on usage. Uh, customers don't pay for the service up until their game hits $100,000 a year in revenue. So it's really sticky because game developers grow up developing using Unity. Um, and without Unity uh, or Epic Games, which offers a competing product called Unreal Engine, developers would have to create their own engines, which is in, in ex extremely time intensive. Before they can start developing the game, it's costly just as a function of how much time it takes. Uh, and also if, we're, if developers were working from scratch, they'd have to rebuild each game for each platform they wanted the game to be playable on. Whereas by using Unity, developers are saving time because they have a sound world-class engine to start with. Uh, and if you develop the game on Unity, you can, you can port it to any console. Uh, you can put it on PC and on mobile extremely easily. So, so there's certainly been an, an explosion in, uh, in content creation as we're all staring at screens all of the time. Let's switch gears for a second because we've talked a lot about technology over the last few years. We've talked about big companies and smaller ones, but it's interesting financials over the last while have started to perform much better. Certainly the investment banks like Morgan Stanley performing well, we focused in, in, uh, in some more specific banks. Do you want to talk about a couple of them? Yeah, certainly. So within the mid cap space, which we've talked about the, the U S regional banks have been among the best performers over the last few months. Um, so we like the regional banks because the interest rates are moving higher and regional banks give us the ability to be a little bit more targeted than you can be investing in the, in the bigger money center banks. Uh, so the first name we really like is Silicon Valley Bank, the ticker is SIVB. They're a commercial bank that specializes in lending to early stage venture capital and private equity backed companies. Uh, CIVB's core competency is, is dealing with these early stage companies. So they know what to look for and they can best serve these small companies uh, many venture capital investors will only allow their portfolio companies to deal with Silicon Valley uh, and Silicon Valley Bank does something that's unique among regional banks in that they often require companies that are looking to borrow to issue warrants that are then held by Silicon Valley Bank and able to be exercised as that company hopefully grows and, and prospers. So CIVB gets to clients early and then sells more products and services in as the company grows. Uh, loan losses are, are minuscule and the warrants that CIVB gets are, are a nice sweetener. Hmm. Uh, and then we also own some Regions Financial. So the ticker is RF. Regions does business in the Southern US. So they have about 1500 branches and 2000 plus ATMs between Florida, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and Louisiana. Uh, they do it all. So the consumer banking side is 60% of revenue. Commercial banking is 35% of revenue. We like regions because of their geographical exposure. So the Southern US is growing faster than the rest of the country. They've also been less affected by COVID related lockdowns, um, but are still nicely levered to a cyclical recovery. So regions specifically does a lot of business lending to construction materials companies, for example. 
Um, and Regions is more sensitive to interest rate changes than a lot of their peers because net interest income is uh, over 65% of revenue. So rally in, in interest rate really, really matters for them. Um, any sort of stimulus package is going to help as well. Uh, on the consumer side, Regions talks about how their clients have some elevated cash levels, so stimulus dollars should incentivize some spending and, and likely borrowing. So just, just it's interesting if you take the lens back, and I, I wanted to throw this up, you know, you, you forget how much damage there were what there was in the financials going through the financial crisis and that here we are you know 12 13 years later and you know so many of these banks are still trading at a fraction of where they were uh back in 2006 7 and in arguably you know they've gone through major restructuring recapitalization uh and and you know significantly falling interest rates which made it hard for them to make money so uh, as we move forward some of these things uh, start to go away and uh, it's the beginning of a new cycle. And, and we find that very interesting. If this is the regional banks, uh, regional banks uh, index, regional banks uh, just, just starting a new cycle. So, so uh, James, thanks, thanks so much for, for doing that. Thanks, Dave. Um, uh, you know, we, we know that the market is going to continue to morph. We know that uh, companies in the technology space are seen to be expensive. But growth has been scarce, and this is a space where there is growth. There are lots of companies within industries that have been out of favor, that have flourished while the industry was out of favor. And when we talk about industrials, for instance, there are so many robotics companies and automation companies that have started to, that have been growing under the surface while industrials have been out of favor. And companies like Silicon Valley Bank Corp that have flourished while the financials were out of favor. So we're gonna to continue to run our models. We're gonna to continue to look for uh, where the strength is in the market. But my comment would be that we are in a market now where there are multiple engines running. There aren't just a few big companies driving the bus. We can be invested and make a difference in mid-sized companies in different industries and not just the equity asset class, but in companies related to commodities, uh, companies related to uh, foreign markets, and uh, we, we're excited about that. At the end of the day, we like diversification. So look, we'll continue to watch for risks, and if things get difficult, we would certainly take action. But I have to say that between 2018 and today, uh, we've been through a lot as a world, as, an, as, as a group of investors. Uh, there have been two major bear markets. Those are behind us and the market is looking forward beyond COVID. So I think that we have two to three years in front of us of a new economic cycle to look forward to and markets are telling us that. So uh, with that, Pam, if there are any questions, certainly we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, uh, James, for joining us this afternoon. David, this question comes from uh, an investor of ours, the US dollar dropping is positive for gold and base metals. Do you see US dollars as the driver or a consequence of money movements in and out of sectors or countries? Well, it's, that's a great question. Um, you know, um, part of it is, is, is it's a reinforcing cycle. So the reason that investors have been selling dollars to begin with is because they were obviously using them to go somewhere with them. And once that begins, there are people who watch the dollar as an indicator to say, hmm, I may not be the first one to figure this out, but clearly there is a balance of evidence that is causing more money to flow out of US dollar into other assets. And that might cause me to do it. Like it's a reinforcing factor for us. Now, uh, certainly, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about Bitcoin and Bitcoin is seen as an alternative currency for some people because, you know, you can only, there, there can only be, ever be 21 million Bitcoins unless they, in, until they have it, you can't print more. And so it's holding value as currencies are falling in price and, uh, and it's, a, it's seen as a store of value. And, and we have, you know, now Bitcoin exposure across our accounts and it's doing particularly well. You know, certainly the, 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 the gold, uh, gold investors care, and we saw this great surge higher in the gold miners, uh, and certainly they corrected recently over the last three months. 
In fact, I put up a chart this morning for the investment team. The, 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 the gold miners corrected 50% of this initial move, but then over the last uh, few days reversed and looks as though we found our low and we'll see where we go from here. But it looks to us as though silver and gold probably are done their correction. They start to move higher at this point. Certainly copper miners, uh, there's Freeport McMoran, which is a holding of ours. Uh, uh, first quantum in the Canadian market, you know, moving higher. These, these are things that people buy if they believe the economic cycle is getting going. And, you know, after many years of underinvestment in new mines, uh, demand will way outstrip supply this year, which means copper prices are going higher. Uh, again, beneficiary of a, of a weak U.S. dollar, but also part of a cause of a weak U.S. dollar. So they go hand in glove. Well, that sounds like uh, it's tis the season. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the movie, said it right, Dave. Silver and gold, silver and gold. <laughs> Everyone wishes for silver and, silver and gold. Um, next question. We had some investors, or not necessarily barometer investors, but we, ha we do know of some investors out there that um, did get nervous in March and uh, sold their positions to cash and have been waiting for a great opportunity to redeploy those assets on the sidelines. Dave, is now a good time to take those assets and redeploy them? Look, th this is the difficulty, you know. Um, when markets break out to new highs, they can certainly correct. But the odds are they're going a lot higher. You know, I, I used a statistic from earlier and I should have put it in the deck. When the market made a new all-time high while having a big month, if you take all the occurrences since 1950, one month out, the market was up on average 58% of the time. But the biggest pullback of all of those occasions was about 5%. If you looked at three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, the market was higher virtually 100% of the time with with about the biggest pullback in one of them was about 10%. So, you know, you can try and get cute and wait for this market to pull back. I'm not sure that it will. Um, we do think that it's going to work its way higher. So if you're really concerned, you know, you could say, I'm going to put half of the money to work now. And, you know, December tends to be a very strong month. Put half the money to work now and put more money to work in January and more money to work in February. And you take out the impact of maybe, you know, uh, a small dip uh, or pullback. But I really think in this greater scheme of things, if you think about all the things we've been worried about over the last number of years, some of those things are not going to be in the market going forward. We aren't going to wake up in the morning to an angry tweet that changes U.S. trade policy. Uh, we've lived with those kinds of mines, mine, mines over the last uh, four years that have made things very difficult. So uh, I, would, I would be inclined to get money to work. Right now, if you think about it, if people were saying, I'm concerned about you know, things going on in the world, we now have a vaccine, and yes, it will take many months, but the world will get vaccinated, right? There will be more stimulus. Uh, we, will, we, 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 we are gonna have a new president inaugurated in January. Um, it is likely there's going to be, you know, some, some air breaks on the Democrats with the strength of, uh, of the Republicans in the Senate. There are a lot of things going forward that are, that are pretty good, uh, and a lot of the uncertainties are, are slowly uh, dissipating. Well, Dave, that's all very positive. So thanks again for a wonderful Wednesday afternoon. James, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see everyone again next Wednesday. Dave, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, look, you know, um, when, when we started talking in 2013 about the U.S. being a new structural bull market, uh, there was a lot of skeptics because market hadn't made progress in many years. If you were to go to Japan today and tell investors there they had likely begun a new 15 or 18 year bull market stocks, after 30 years of the market going nowhere, there's a lot of people who would probably laugh in your face. Um, when you have all of these major assets going through watershed moments at the same time, that's a really good thing. 
uh, and there certainly will be pullbacks and there certainly will be surprises. But the structural backdrop is a positive one for reflationary assets. And we have to be invested differently today than we were over the last 10 and 15 and 20 years in a disinflationary world. Uh, and for those that get set up uh, to take advantage of it, you know, the returns can be significant. I mean, I use a simple example uh, of Rio Tinto as an example, one of the largest global miners in the world. Um, after a long bear market in this stock, it broke out in the late 2000s and ran up. It was a 10 bagger in the last, in the last run up in commodity prices. So Rio Tinto has just gone sideways since 2011 and just broken out to a new high. Commodity cycles are like stock cycles. Long bull markets give very significant returns. You know, this, this, this can be a double or triple over a relatively short number of years. Uh, and, uh, and I can tell you, these companies are underowned and unloved. Um, but, you know, in the case of Rio, you can pick up a 5% dividend on a company that's making money uh, at the end of a bear market in the asset class. Thanks, very much. Thanks everybody for, for joining us and certainly don't hesitate to call if you have any questions. Uh, and if we don't speak to you before the holidays, try to have a wonderful holiday. It'll be a different one for sure. Uh, but uh, a year from now, I think we're going to be in a different space. Thanks so much, Dave. And thank you, everyone.